Hi, this is Braden Holpe. Hey, this is Tanner the Bulldozer Bozer. Hi, this is Brian Burke from Toronto, Ontario. This is Daryl Sutter. Hello, everyone. I'm Carly Agro from Sportsnet Central. This is Jay Onright. This is Quick Dick Quick Dick coming to you from Tufnel, Saskatchewan. Hey, everybody. My name is Theo Fleury. This is Kelly Rudy. This is Corey Cross. This is Wade Redden. This is Jordan Tutu. My name is Jim Patterson. Hey, it's Ron McLean, Hockey Night in Canada and Rogers Hometown Hockey, and welcome to the Sean Newman Podcast. Welcome to the podcast, folks. We got a great one on tap for you today. One that I finally get to check off the old bucket list. One of the names that's been on there, and uh, it's finally checked. But before we get there, let's get to today's episode sponsors. First off, Carly Clausen and Windsor Plywood, builders of the podcast studio table. For everything wood, these are the guys, whether we're talking mantles, decks, windows, doors, or sheds, when you want quality, stop in and see these folks at Windsor Plywood, or just hop on your phone. I mean, Instagram, Facebook, take a look at their their uh, their stuff online, and you can just see the quality. 780-875-9663, give them a call, and they'll get you hooked up. Jen Gilbert and team want you to know, for over 40 years, since 1976, the dedicated realtors of Coldwell Banker, Cityside Realty, have served Lloydminster and the surrounding area. They're passionate about our community, and they pride themselves on giving back through volunteer opportunities and partnerships as often as they can. We know that home is truly where the awesomeness happens. Coldwell Banker, Cityside Realty, for everything real estate, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 780-875-3343. Clinton team over at Trophy Gallery. Championship belts, custom medals, die-cast signage, name tags and engravings on Yetis and Brewmates, business awards in crystal and glass. They ship Canada-wide, and if you go online at trophygallery.ca, they got over 5,000 products, and if you use Newman Pro, uh, promo code, promo code, can't say that, if you use promo code Newman, you save 15%. Any sport, any time, from bodybuilding to hockey, visit trophygallery.ca. HSI Group, they are the local oil field burners and combustion experts that can help make sure you have a compliant system working for you. The team also offers security, surveillance, and automation products for uh, residential, commercial, livestock, and agricultural applications. They use technology to give you peace of mind so you can focus on the things that truly matter. Stop in a day and visit Kim or Brody at 3902 52nd Street or give them a call 306 825 6310. Clay Smiley, Profit River. Profit River is a retailer of firearms, optics, and accessories serving all of Canada. They specialize in importing firearms from the United States, hard to find calibers, rare firearms, special editions. Check them out at ProfitRiver.com. Gardner Management is a Lloyd Minster based company specializing in all types of rental properties to help meet your needs, whether you're looking for a small office like yours truly or a 6,000 square foot. Commercial space, give Wade Gertner a call at 780-808-5025. Shout out to the team at Read and Write for the SMP billboard. We're talking about, of course, Miss Deanna Wandler and her amazing crew there. They've done amazing work. If you want any outdoor uh, advertising done, check out Read and Write. Give them a call today. If you're heading into any of these businesses, make sure you let them know you heard about them on the podcast. We'd love to have you on here. Uh, if you're interested in advertising, head to SeanNewmanPodcast.com. In the top right corner, hit the contact button and send me your info. we got lots of different options. and want to find something that can work for the both of us. Now let's get on to that T-Bar 1, Tale of the Tape. Originally from Kingston, Ontario, he played one game in the NHL for the Boston Bruins. Over 700 games in the minor leagues. He spent five years as the coach of the Boston Bruins, where he made the Stanley Cup Finals twice. He spent one year as the head coach of the Colorado Rockies. In 1981, he was hired by the CBC as a color commentator, but it would be a year later, in 1982, where he made his big impression on his debut on Coach's Corner. For the next 37 years, he co-hosted the show, becoming part of the fabric of the Canadian culture. I'm talking about Mr. Don Cherry. So buckle up. Here we go. Hey, this is Don Cherry. Now, don't forget, listen to Sean's broadcast. It's one of the best. Well, welcome to the Sean Newman Podcast. Today, I am joined by Mr. Don Cherry. Sir, how's it going? Very good, going very good, good. Uh, 
Uh, I'm doing my podcast now and uh, the Twitter, and I'm having a lot of fun. So uh, thank you very much for having me on the show. Uh, Appreciate you hopping on, Don. Um, you know, a lot of Western Canada always, uh, we, we think awfully high about your views, and uh, I know a lot of people always wonder, how is Mr. Cherry these days? Uh, the podcast is a roaring success for yourself, the grapevine. Uh, how has been the change from going, uh, you know, live broadcasts every Saturday night and, and more to uh, doing the doing the podcast? Well, I do miss uh, doing Coach's Corner. I had a lot of fun doing it, and uh, I look forward to it. Well, when you do it for over 40 years, you, you sort of look forward to it. Uh, and uh, I do miss it. There's no, uh, no doubt about it. But you have to do what you have to do. And I did what I had to do, and, uh, and I felt the same way. And I think a lot of people from the West feel the same way as I do. And uh, the podcast, uh, uh, my son, uh, Timothy, and my daughter, and uh, Dell, my grandson, he, he's the guy that makes the sound so good. And uh, we go over and we, we, we sit around uh, and uh, just shoot the breeze and have a lot, a, lot, a lot of fun. And Tim has a lot of questions. He has the questions there. I don't quite understand it quite that I should, <laughs> but uh, he, uh, he understands it. And um, I have a lot of fun. And the Twitter, Twitter is, uh, we were picked a, uh, the, the be- one of the best um, podcasts of uh, uh, 2020. And um, my Twitter has over 800,000. So I, I still have a lot of fun. And um, long as long as it's fun, that's, that's the main thing. Well, I, I got to say, Don, I, I, A, getting you on before Christmas. Here's, I'm sure you get this all the time. But uh, growing up in the Newman household, uh, one of the staples of Christmas morning was we'd give Dad a box of turtles, followed quickly by in his stocking, Rock'em Sock'em. And so the Newman household every morning on Christmas Day was eating chocolate, watching your Rock'em Sock'em videos, and we did that for, you know, up until, obviously, I moved out of Mom and Dad's house. But even after we'd come back from college, me and my older brother, Harley, we still did it until, you know, we finally were both married and had kids of our own and, and that kind of thing. But I assume you get that all the time. Uh, but you entered everybody's houses on Christmas morning, at least around these parts. And uh, for you to come on and be on December 23rd, uh, right before Christmas, is... As close to uh, I can get as bringing Rock'em Sock'em back for the people here in Lloydminster or and, and you know surrounding communities. Well, isn't that nice of you to say that? Uh, again, it was my son that did it, uh, Timothy, and um, we did it for over thirty years. We thought thirty years was enough, and uh, I, I don't I don't think th- too many people have a CD anymore. But we did it for thirty years, and uh, Tim again was. Uh, instrumental in doing it all and uh, i had a lot of fun doing it we did it di- i remember we had a we had different a, i remember one time um i went and um, i tried on uh i was wore a kilt one time and i, I picked up the wrong kilt and rose was small and i it's holy smokes i haven't put on this much weight and i couldn't put on the kilt <laughs> so we put it on backwards it was really funny we did put it on backwards and we did it in uh, the Hall of Fame. Along, I forget which, which one that was, but uh, it was a lot. Of, we had a lot of fun doing it, and I'm glad uh, Hardy and uh, you uh, listened to it. And um, we did have a lot. Of, again, again um, if you don't have fun doing it, then uh, there's no, no sense in doing it. But it was that. Uh, that was a lot of work for 30 years. We did it for 30 years and had a lot. Of, and um, Timothy was the head uh, guy that did it. That did that too. Uh, well, you guys did an exceptional job. I, we were at work. We we pulled it up on on YouTube there the other day. Just to, it's it's honestly impresses me about going back to those videos. I I didn't realize uh, we quote that all the time, right? Like one of my I had I had Cheevers Jerry Cheevers, obviously uh, your favorite goaltender on the podcast a little yeah. while back, and I was explaining to him. Uh, one of my favorite stories that you've said is about Bobby Orr embarrassing the Atlanta Flames uh, where he goes end to end on a penalty kill. Nobody wants to go behind the net, and he ends up going, and then you know he tucks yeah. the, the goal in. And we got watching it, and I can't believe how many things you say in, in Rock'em Sock'em that as a kid you internalized and, you know, don't lay on the ice, uh, you know, tea time, all the things that are in there. Were just became so much ingrained in the Canadian 
hockey culture, I guess. Yeah, it. Uh, we had, like I say, with the um, a lot of kids listened to it, and if you notice, there was never any swearing in it. The same as the podcast, that there's never any swearing. And I did my books. I, I did four books with number one author in the book. I don't understand that. I just I just told a story to Al Strachan. You remember Al? He was, used to write for the Gazette, and uh, I think of the Sun. But um, no, it. it um, they were all it, kid, it, people weren't weren't afraid to have the kids listen to um, the Rock'em Sock'ems or, or the books or anything like that. There's never an end the podcast. There's never any swearing in it because I know a lot of kids listen to it and and um, I, I I just don't go for it. I mean, uh, when I played and when I coached, I guess I was pretty bad <laughs> <laughs> with the, with the swearing and that. I'll tell you a funny story. We're in. Um, I I was just thinking of it the other day. I was running Maple Leaf Gardens. Believe it or not, when uh, when they first started in the gardens, and I coached, uh, the people used to go and get a hot dog. They'd be in amongst the bench, and they had, they put, had to put police at the, at the other end to stop them. <laughs> wait till wait till the, the uh, a commercial will come on. And I remember this uh, older lady. It was about twelve rows up, and I was coaching the Bruins, and uh, she said, "Cherry, you got a filthy mouth." And oh, she was about my mother's age. And did I ever feel bad? So I went up. And I sat in the, and while the game was going on, I'm talking to her, and I said to her, no, ma'am, you've heard that language before. She's, yeah, but I didn't pay 200 bucks for it. <laughs> so we, <laughs> so it was, uh, as you know, and uh, as Harley knows, that uh, there's never any swearing in uh, at Rock'em Sock'em's, and I, I just don't believe in it. And when I did my banquets, too, I remember I was in Lloyd Mister, I did a banquet, and I was, I knew, I, some of the other guys used to swear, used to say that F word all the time. I don't know, I think they just did it to, I don't know why they did it, but they did it. But I never did. And uh, I think that's why a lot of kids uh, watch Rock'em Sock'em, not because uh, it was, it was a tough, we, only, we never had, we, I think we only had three fights in it, the whole thing. Everybody thinks the Rock'em Sock'em was banging and, you know, a lot, but it wasn't. It was teaching the kids safety and, and the whole deal. So I was quite, I was quite thrilled that um, that we lasted thirty years. Not not too many people last thirty years and something. Well, I tell you what, you're earning brownie points with my mother right now because from time to time I may have the odd colorful comment come out on the podcast, and my mother always <laughs> listens. She always gives gives me hell about it, Don, and I have to well, apologize. That's good. Your so. mother knows, but always listen to your mother. You'll never go wrong, and that's that. I'm <laughs> glad she she agrees with me. <laughs> Now, growing up, uh, Don, did like, did you see, you know, I mean, nobody could see how, I highly doubt you could see that, wow, you're going to do all these amazing things. You're going to have this career that is, you know, you were voted number seven of most, what was it, uh, most popular Canadians, most famous Canadians, something like that. And I remember thinking, like, just think about that. A guy who commentates is one of the most influential Canadians of all time. But when you were a young guy, did you ever go like, wow, I want to make the NHL. I'm sure you're like every other Canadian. But as a yeah. young guy, did well, you see that coming? No, I, I'll tell you the, the truth. I was unimp- when I, um, uh, I was very f- stupid uh, when I was young uh, that I never paid attention in school. I don't know what I was thinking. And uh, all I did was want to play hockey. <laughs> I, I did play hockey, but I played in the American League. And, you know, when I was through, I had no trade. I had no education. I, didn't, I couldn't get a job. And um, I, I'm going to tell you the truth. This is, this is the uh, truth, uh, truth of my Mr. Hospital and that. Though, you know, I know you're doing it, so I'm going to tell you the truth, that I was unemployed. I couldn't get a job anywhere. I, and um, uh, I think it was about 19... I forget uh, what it was. Anyhow, it was a recession. It was in down in the states. I was living in Rochester, New York, and um, I, I, I established myself as the world's worst uh, car salesman. And I tried to <laughs> sell cars, but I just couldn't approach people cold. I just couldn't. I was just—I uh, don't know why—I was too shy or something. I don't know whatever it was. And um, I—I was—I was—I was down and out. And I really was. And I know what it's like to be unemployed. And it, it's tough. It's it, it's tough. I would six months. I couldn't get a I couldn't get a job, and I had a family and the whole deal. And I and I said to the Lord, I remember one day I was I laid down. 
I go to have a nap, and I said, I don't even deserve a nap, and uh, that's how bad I felt about myself. And I, I said, I remember I got my knees, and I said to the Lord, I said, is this it? I mean, I'm 36 years old, and I'm finished. And I swear to God, uh, honestly, I, I, it's hard to believe, but a voice said to me, get back and get back into hockey. And I never thought about getting back into hockey. And um, I made a comeback. I'm going to hurry this through. I made a comeback, and uh, halfway through the season, I get... Uh, I, I got made coach, and um, three, year, three years from that, I was coach of Bobby Orr. And, um, I rem- but I remember getting on my hands and knees, or on my knees, and um, saying to the Lord, I said, am I finished? And, and, I, and I, I, mean, I couldn't get a job. I had no trade. I had nothing. And nothing was going, on, nothing was going right. And um, from that day on, three years from that, year, that day on, uh, I, was co- I was coach of Bobby Orr. So... <laughs> You know, it just shows you to never give up because nobody was lower than I was. There, you no trade and no education, no nothing. And it was it was a tough it was a tough to, tough time to go on. I know a lot of th- guys are out west having a tough time with the oil and all that and everything like that. So don't give up. It um, trust in the Lord and and um, it'll work out. You're talking. You went back. A I I think that's. That right there, what you just said, is probably every... There's a lot of people out here, Don, that need to hear that because it is some pretty low times uh, out west, uh, specifically in our area. Um, it's a you know an agricultural town, but uh, oil, has, oil and gas, the energy sector, has really done wonders to this part of the world, and it has been taking a beating uh, not only this year but years yeah. years previous and everything going on there's a lot of people hurting so uh, I appreciate you sharing that because I think that'll speak to a lot of people it's uh well I don't uh, I don't talk about that too too much but I I feel that that there are some guys out there that are, and, and I know how they feel because um, there's there's you know it's 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 a tough when you got a family and um yeah I had no money coming in I had no money coming in and and um but uh, the Lord, I know it's t- it's easy to, for me to say, but um, it was a tough deal. And three years from then, I was coaching Bobby Orr. Can you imagine that? And, you know, Bobby Orr, I mean, I, I, I remember I stood on the Boston Gardens, and, and you know, I said, holy smokes, is this really happening to me? <laughs> and um, so don't give up. I mean, I remember. <laughs> I stand, I stand, and I remember the dead in the Boston Gardens. And, and, you know, it's a funny thing. Um, I got asked by uh, one of the, one of the owners of Rochester, but at the time it wasn't. A, it was uh, it was uh, Bob Clark, and I remember his name, Bob Clark, and he asked me to coach the high school team. Well, I remember I was just as nervous uh, uh, coaching the high school team because that's how they get started. You know, coach minor hockey. You know, you change the lines and have the practice and everything. So when I got made coach halfway through the season in Rochester, I was ready to go because I. I, because I changed lines and I did everything in high school, so it was it was, uh, it was a tough deal. But um, you never know what's going to happen. You got to you got to keep you got to keep plugging. Oh, I I hundred percent agree. I find it very fascinating, Don. You know, all your success that you've had. You know, in my lifetime, all I've ever known you to be is a successful guy. I think that's a lot of people. I'm. I, uh, I was born in 86, so by the time I was old enough to remember anything, Rock'em Sock'em's were already rolling along. I think the first yeah. one came out in 89. So, uh, you know, and you were already on Coach's Corner by the time, you know, I, like that was just part of the fabric of our society back then and Saturday nights yeah. and watching you and, and Ron McLean. Uh, I, I had Ron on, um, oh, midsummer and – uh, I was saying it was such a nice balance of society, I figured. Uh, Skip Craig, who used to be a Boston Bruin just before you got there. Oh, I remember Skip, yeah. Great guy. And he was on the podcast, and he, he said something to me, Don, that has absolutely stuck with me since he said it. I can never shake it. Is hockey mirrors society. And I always thought uh, Coach's Corner mirrored society. You had You had Ron with his ideals. And you had Don with his ideals, and they were just, they were such a perfect compliment. I, I always thought, because, and that's what made it entertaining, right? You both weren't bashing. Well, I don't, I don't, I, I still don't know. Somebody asked me about that, and I said, I still don't know. I, and and um, I just went out and, and uh, spoke like the regular guy, and, and um, I, I, I tried to get things that I thought people would be interested in. 
and um, you know, I just we just uh, it was the, it was um, forty years. I think it was forty years we we're going. I, I think I was going on nineteen eighty. I think it was, and, um, and then this year got terminated. But um, I went from nineteen eighty, and I when I first started out, I, I used to do color, and I used to favor the Boston Bruins too much, and they told me. <laughs> You can't favor the boss of Bruins. <laughs> you can't be doing that, Don. Yeah, I I got told that, and I, I re, and um, I, the, I, my last day of coloring, Craig McTavish scored the um, overtime goal or something or sort of goal, and I said we're beating them Montreal. I said we're beating them tonight. That was the last time I ever did color. <laughs> so at the end, they said, "Well, uh, Ralph Melody, who was uh, who liked me, I guess." And he says, we'll just put him on at the end of the first period and give him three or four minutes. And how could he get in trouble there? Little did he know. <laughs> do you remember the fir- Do you remember the first time you got that little segment, uh, Don? And, and was it well received? Like, I, what was the no, first coach's corner like? I don't remember. I was on with Dave Hodge. I don't think Dave liked me very much, and um, I don't think he really wanted to be on. <laughs> But um, I was on with Dave Hodge, but I don't remember the very first one. But I remember the very first one with Ron McLean. Uh, Ron Ron had a, uh, a a habit of all looking down all the time, and they told him you've got to st- you stop looking down. You got to stare. You know, got to talk to the people you're being interviewed. <laughs> and I, and I remember the very first one I was doing with them. There was a great big you know when you stare something at something. He was staring at me in the eye, and a great big tear running down his. Holy, is this guy going to cry every time he does Coach's <laughs> Corner? And uh, but I remember that one. That was that was a funny one. And um, uh, he didn't quite get it the first uh, the first year. Or so he was very serious, you know. And I think he come, he comes from Red Deer, and I used to kid him all the time and everything. And um, he didn't quite get it. Then all of a sudden, he just he snapped into it and got got carried. But but I mean, the first couple, the first year anyhow, he didn't quite get it. He's very, um, very sensitive guy, and um, I know he comes from Red Deer. He thinks uh, high, very highly of Red Deer and all that. He's always talking about Red Deer. So, yeah, I, that was the first one. I remember the very first one I did with him. That was the first, but I don't remember the, the first first one I did with Dave Hodge. I can't remember. I was always in trouble all the time. I don't know why, but I always was. <laughs> they were going to fire me about ten times. I don't know how I how I ever lasted for forty years is beyond me. I remember the one guy. He was the head of the thing, and he said, and we had a meeting, uh, and uh, I remember it was down at the Blue Chase. They had a, and I didn't want to meet me in his office, I guess. And uh, he says, he says my legacy is going to be, I, he says, I'm retiring in three months. He says, my legacy is going to be that I get rid of you. <laughs> I said, we'll see. And um, never did, uh, but he, he, I know he'd like to. What is it, the, whole, the whole bunch of them would have liked to get rid of me. And... Um, I don't know how I lasted forty years. Do now that now that I get talking about it, I don't. I really don't. I was supposed to be gone ten, but I thought. <clears throat> and 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 that um, thing they had with um, the greatest Canadian. It was called the greatest Canadian. Well, I I don't consider myself the greatest Canadian. I think it was I was I was on TV. I think they knew me. That's the only reason that they they voted for me. And I remember a guy out west had a, a license said the Wild Rose from Alberta, and. Uh, I still have it hanging up. It said "Vote for, vote for," uh, and it had a cherry on it. And I, I still, I, I framed it, and I, I still have it in my uh, office. It, was, it really made me, really made me feel good. So, no, I don't remember the first one with Hodge, but I remember the first one with Ron. Did you ever, you know, you are a guy who says what is on his mind, and that is a, a rare characteristic these days. Uh, my grandmother used to be the same way. Yeah, she used to just tell. There was no splitting words, right? It was I, I say what what I'm what I mean, and uh, today is a little different than that. Um, did you ever get accustomed to the some of the backlash you you received on? Was that like I highly doubt it was enjoyable, but I assume after like the first ten times, you're like, yeah, this is gonna send them running, right? Like, I mean. Because as as many people as that loved you, there was always the opposite that just wanted to hate on you. You, you mentioned a guy wanting to get rid of you in his career like that. I mean, that's got to be almost like a surreal experience to have somebody say that. 
No, I remember my very first write-up uh, that was bad write-up about me was a good friend of mine, uh, and I thought he was a good friend. Well, he still is. I already was. It was, it was a writer for The Sun, I think. No, and it wasn't The Sun. It was The Star, Toronto Star, and it was uh, Trent Frayne. I remember, I was, holy smoke, did he give it to me. I didn't know. I, I, you know, I had never had a bad write-up before. And, uh, I didn't know if I could go on. I didn't know if I could go on Coach's Corner, to tell you the truth. Uh, it was so bad. I mean, you know, I forget forget what it was, but it was my first. And then, then I got toughened on that one. Then I got a little tougher and a little tougher. And actually, to tell you the truth, I looked for, I didn't mind them at all. I didn't. Uh, they wanted to write bad things about me. I remember one lady that writes. She's still writing, by the way. She lists bad uh, ten things. How and and one of them was the misogynist. I didn't even know what a misogynist was. I thought it was massaging people, and um, <laughs> and what did you? What else did she call me? A troglodyte. I said, "What the hell's a troglodyte?" And I found it was a little, a little a midget, I guess, that li- lived underneath a bridge. <laughs> so she was she was reaching for a lot of things I was. Anyhow, uh, uh, to answer your question, I got used to them, and um, I I didn't. Uh, the people that didn't like me, I just took them where they came from. They were left wing. Uh, uh, that did not like me, and uh, I didn't like them, so it didn't make any difference. It didn't didn't bother me. But the first one, holy smokes! I remember, I didn't know whether I could go back if I could do hockey in Canada again. To tell you the truth. Yeah, well, I can imagine that uh, over a lifetime of having that, you eventually become accustomed to it. But like all of us, the first one must have stung. It must have been a a, a dagger to you. It was. It was. Uh, I didn't even, and I, I I think it was Saturday morning, and I didn't know if I could go on television that night. It, it hurt so bad because I didn't, I was, you know, I didn't think I was, doing, I didn't think I was that bad, and uh, holy smokes! And then, like I say, you get used to them, and I got a lot of bad ones. And but I I look for after a while, after a while you look forward to them, and it doesn't hurt you at all. But the first one, if you've never had it before, it's pretty tough. Yeah. I I certainly can't say uh, uh I'm I'm uh, I'm pretty as you can tell from uh, 20 minutes Don I'm I'm pretty uh I don't know relaxed I I I like to I consider myself a young guy at 34 which to the 20 year old I'm old but uh I look at you Don and I I go you're a guy who's lived a lot of life you've seen a lot of things and um been around some very interesting people had a fortunate uh, run in your career, I would say, and uh, yeah, I, ju- uh, well, I just mean that in the sense that you're absolutely right. You could have been done. You could have uh, to to last as long as you did without having a major, not not only just an incident on on air, but just you know, like life could have hit you somewhere, and you could have been going left instead of right, and. I mean, to sit and get to pick your brain for an hour is something I will never forget. And I just want to, I want to soak in all the knowledge you got in between your ears and, and, and see if there's some things to learn. Well, I, 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 to tell tell you the truth, I, as I said before, it was the Lord, you know, I mean, and I, I can hear, I can hear a lot of guys now listening to this guy talking, but it's a true story. And, um, I do believe in the Lord. I go to church, try to go to church, and um, I was uh, I was down. I just nobody's down and out more than I was. I had um, I had nothing going at all, really. I had nothing. In fact, let's see, what year was that? That would have been that would have been back in the sixties, I think. I made a comeback, and uh, like I told you, like earlier, I told you about the thing. It was so I, I've had a pretty good life, and. Um, as they say, there's there's a lot more. There's a lot be, a lot of days behind me than there are in front of me. So, but I've had a good time. And um, it, this big thing is um, my son Timothy is the guy that uh, does it all. And I've been very fortunate. Uh, and um, and like I said, those guys. I know some guys are listening right now that are unemployed. I know how you feel because I uh, I remember my mother phoned and they asked how are you doing. I used to, used to get mad at my mother. <laughs> How am I doing? <laughs> you bet it's your mother. And um, it was tough. And, and you have a good woman. 
I had a, uh, you know, I, she never complained, and uh, it was, um, I don't know what, I would, don't know what I would have done if she had a complaint and, you know, and had been whining all the time and everything. But she knew I'd somehow I'd come out of it, and I, 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 at least I think she did anyhow. I read, and now this, for all the ladies listening, when you talk about a good woman, I read in the minors you moved 53 times. Yeah, and I remember, remember Rose when we had a um, uh, when I when I told her we were going to Three Rivers, and she was from Hershey. She a lovely home in Hershey, and and uh, Hershey is like a paradise, you know. And she said, "Where's Three Rivers?" And I, I didn't know where Three Rivers Quebec was either. And um, I remember taking the uh, um, we had a, uh, a, a cardboard box. And she was taking the ketchup, had to get the ketchup and the mustard and stuff like that. It was half full because we couldn't afford to buy new mu- mustard. <laughs> I remember the cardboard box putting in uh, putting in the half ketchup and stuff like that. We couldn't leave it because we couldn't afford to buy new stuff over there. And I and I remember and I remember halfway through, I had I had a car with bald tires on it, and I, I remember we were in a re- we were somewhere in Quebec. I don't know where it was. And uh, the car wouldn't start. We'd get soft for gas, and the car wouldn't start. And um, and it was about 11 o'clock at night, and it was, you know, it was cold. It was right in the middle of winter. Let me out in the middle of winter. And uh, we went into the coffee shop, and, I, and Cindy, my daughter, was with me. She was about, she, she'd be about three or four. And, uh, yeah, she'd be about three or four. And I said, now let's all pray that the car starts, because they were going to close up at 11. I don't know what we would have, would have froze to death. And uh, car started, and uh, I was lost, and I was, I was, the, I was, I, so I got there, we had to play, and um, hadn't eaten, and, and Rose went into a motel. And I, uh, I played that afternoon, imagine I get there, I had to play that afternoon. And uh, on the way, the guys, the guys, the guys that are listening, I'll say, and the guy said, come on, Don, you got to stop for one beer, you know, and I, and I said, well, I better stop, you know, I said, better get back to the motel. And they said, no, no, no you better, come on, you have one. Well, you know, I have one and <laughs> two. And all of a sudden, I look at the they're watch, and it's about 4 o'clock. Oh, it was, you know, the game is over. Well, it must have been later than that, about 6 o'clock. And I got back to the motel, and I was hadn't eaten for, for about 24 hours. She was eating chocolate bars. So I, I went in and... Um, all the wives were at a place called the Golden Rooster. I'll never forget it. And Cindy came, and I gave Cindy a bunch of dimes, and she played the one. They had one arm bandit. So anyhow, <laughs> and Rose got with all the wives, and um, we, you know, back in those days, it was only there was only six teams in the National Hockey League, and there was six teams in the American League, six teams in the Western League, and oh, in the Central League there was six. So that's I think it was. It worked out to be about 18 or something like that. But there was, and defensemen, there was six, they, they carry five, so there was 30, there was 30 defensemen in the whole, in the whole, uh, in the National Hockey League. Now there, I think there's, they carry about eight, and there's about 30, so there's about three, three or four hundred right then. But back in those days, if you didn't make the National Hockey League, you were, you were, yeah, the American League was good, was the second best. Western League was the third best in the Central League. The whole of uh, all of hockey from last from the year before, like from from back then, would be playing in the National Hockey League right now. But um, it was only thirty. Imagine that only thirty defensemen in the whole world in the National Hockey League. Hard to believe. Hard to believe. That's that's uh, fine company you were in. Yeah, they were all they were all good. They they make the National Hockey League now, and. Um, it was tough hockey. It was big boy hockey back then. It was a lot tougher. Um, I don't. I don't think it was better, but it was tougher. And uh, the guy, the guys back then, there were maybe about three or four guys can, uh, you know, really hammer a puck on a team. But uh, now everybody can shoot a puck. I mean, everybody got those sticks and everything. Can, and uh, it's a lot different now than it was back in those days. And I mean, I'm glad the players are making the money they're making now. I mean, we we go in. I remember with Punch Imlac, I signed my contract, and I he designed. He said, "Don't you want it?" And I said, "Well, are you going to give me any more money?" 
No, I said, well, what's the sense of arguing with you? And Punch, he was um, he was in Springfield uh, before he went to National Hockey League. He said, well, I'm going to National Hockey League. And, but you, I, a lot of people don't remember Punch Imlach. Punch Imlach was, uh, I think he had won four Stanley Cups with the uh, Toronto Maple Leafs. So I had I, and I, I hit the tough guys. I hit uh, half M's in my junior. He was the, probably the smartest guy I ever played for, but he wasn't a very nice guy. And then I went to right, right, right from him, and I went to Eddie Shore. Geez, I hit the tough guys. I'll tell you, boy, there's nobody tougher in the world than Eddie Shore. He was a tough guy. We'll call him eccentric now. <laughs> Back then, I think he was nuts, but uh, <laughs> we'll call him eccentric now. The way the world is going, we have to be careful. What uh, What was one of the tough things that Mr. Shore had you do, maybe in a practice? Well, that was a tough one. Yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, Brian Kilray, the winningest coach ever in junior hockey. And a fantastic really, really, book, yeah. Don. That's a yeah. fantastic yeah, book. Uh, there's a guy you should get uh, on, too, is uh, Brian Kilray. He'll t- he 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 got stories about Eddie Shore, more stories than anybody. But he he and Eddie Shore really liked him, and I I didn't uh, he didn't like me. I don't know why. I guess I I, I still I never said anything back bad back to him. He just didn't, didn't like me. And uh, but he liked uh, Brian Killer. Eh? He liked guys that could skate with their knees bent. And unfortunately, I was one of those guys that uh, that stiff legged skater. And he, man, he never liked me. And I, I, he thought I was too, um, too rough. Imagine Eddie Shore thinking I was too rough. <laughs> he says, you, I remember, him, remember him saying, um, Mr. Cherry, in, 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 um, if you could visualize that in reality, your maneuverability is nil. That's pretty good. I didn't know what he was talking about, but anyhow, uh, he sent me to Three Rivers, and then uh, I think the, a year later, he sent me to Sudbury, Ontario. So he didn't like me. But he liked uh, Brian Kilray. Boy, Brian Kilray could go an hour easy. He's um, he knows he knows he, he he was with Eddie Shore. I think he, in fact he liked Eddie Shore so much. He was with the L.A. Kings. He got the first goal for the L.A. Kings, and he wasn't. I don't know. He didn't like it there, and he has to go back to t- Springfield. <laughs> I couldn't believe anybody would ask him back to Springfield, but he did. And. He, he's a winning coach ever, and I think he's with 2,000 wins or something like that. Won the Memorial Cup uh, Coach of the Year yeah. in uh, OHL. So he's the guy you should get on too. You know, in your in your lifetime, in your career of uh, playing in the minors to coaching in the NHL to being on Hockey Night in Canada and commentating and everything, can you believe how far hockey has come? Like, I mean... From the days of six teams to we're about to have 32, uh, the money, uh, the the availability to watch games, you know, like growing up, it was Saturday night. That, there wasn't much, you know. And if you were older than me, you remember the days of the radio and and uh, curl up around it, listening to Foster Hewitt and things like that. Can I you remember believe- when, I, I remember when uh, we were young, we used to play, uh, we used to, Skate all day uh, at, at the, the school, middle school, and then we'd come home and we'd play um, uh, a road hockey. And your mother would come in. My, my, my mother would come in and get, we'd have our bath, we'd have our cocoa, and we'd sit and we'd listen. We'd fall asleep after a while because we were young, and we used to listen to Foster Hewitt. And he never did the first period, eh? Uh, he did the um, he did the second period. And somehow or other, just hearing the voice of uh, Foster Hewitt uh, give you chills. Just to, he was more popular than the uh, the players. And just listening to Foster Hewitt was really something. I, I know people can't believe it. They <laughs> watch listen to, or listening to radio, but it was a big deal. And I suppose um, I guess hockey. And and then and then um, back in, in early days, they were just trying to make the Leafs on. That's why they're so popular, I guess. And uh, but I remember here. I remember when I was a little boy, listening to Foster Hewitt, and he'd come at the end of the uh, end of the first period, and he'd say the score is three nothing for Toronto or something. And you know the players used to do something they don't do anymore. The only time they do it, the only time they bang the boards is uh, after a fight. You ever notice that? And um, but they used to bang bang it after a goal, and uh, the, and yeah, somehow you had a feeling. 
close to the players. You could almost hear the players bang the boards. If you don't ever, and the players don't bang the boards now, except uh, both teams bang the boards <laughs> after a fight, which is, which is uh, you know, and they're trying to get, and the fighting is down. All the fighting is down and everything. The <laughs> funny thing is, but the guy's making the money now. Holy guy. Guy's making, uh, guy's making $3 million that, um, that scored 14 goals. If you scored 14 goals before, you didn't hang around too long. But, uh, you know, um, uh, McDavid, uh, whatever money he's getting, he's getting a lot of money. He, he deserves every penny because he's the best hockey player in the world, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and I saw him when he was a, a minor. When he was a, a, a minor, he was a him actually. And um, he was terrific, and he was terrific back then. There's another guy who he come up and play with uh, Roland McEwen. I remember he, he was he was a defenseman. I see somebody's picked him up. I forget who's picked him up now, but they both of them come up and played um, uh, Bantam hockey uh, for the Toronto Maple Leafs. And you knew David. You just say and look at him, boy. He's uh, he's the best player in the world. When you mention. Well, A, as an Oilers fan, we uh, we get to see McDavid and Mr. Dreisaitl do their magic every single night. Hopefully, uh, sooner than later, we'll go a little deeper in the playoffs. I know a lot of uh, this area, we've we've had a, a tough go for a few years, Don, but with some of the best players in the world suiting up for the oil, it's been a lot of fun watching. Um, cause, uh, <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't old enough to remember the glory days of, of the boys on the bus, of Gretzky and... Messier and the list goes on they and never on and on. The only time they were on the bus is when they went from the from the from marina to the airplanes. Who are they kidding? Boys <laughs> on the bus, back to the bus. <laughs> I mean that that uh, that was uh, whoever thought that up was boys on the bus. They all flew out there and uh, they you know they had a great club. Where, where would they go on the bus? They never went anywhere on the bus. The only maybe they go to Calgary, and what <laughs> else? <laughs> I, I had to laugh when they when I read that boys on the bus. They never spent the bus. We used to spend eight and ten hours on the bus, and um, in the American Hockey League, that was the way we 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 played. I mean, we we got used to the bus. I went from junior hockey right to the American League, and and I didn't know any difference. But I had to laugh when I saw the headlines. Boys on the bus. But they were the, they had a great club, and. Uh, no, I, you're very lucky out there to see you get you get to see McDavid. I know he, they don't go far in the playoffs and dry title, but you, at least you get to see uh, uh, McDavid, the best player in the world. And, and you know the fans are pretty good there. Uh, they don't boo. You, and uh, yeah, I, I have always said that. I'm not saying that because I know that the. the um, you know the uh, uh, Oilers fans and listen to that, but they if you listen to them. They don't boo the power play, which is, well, I guess even when, when they had a bad power play, they don't have a bad power play now, but they had a bad power play back then. And uh, they didn't boo, which was great. I, I, As a player, I used to appreciate that because uh, every other city does the same thing. They boo the power play. And Montreal, they boo the power play. And Toronto here, they, they, it's not going, they boo. So as a player, I always I always remembered that they didn't boo the power play. <laughs> Funny, eh? You know, you, you talk about great, uh, McDavid, and then, you know, just in passing of Gretzky and the boys. Uh, your first year coaching, you get to – I'm a defenseman, uh, Don, I, and I've heard the stories. It's probably why I enjoy uh, him embarrassing the Flames so much on your Rock'em Sock'em tape, is Bobby Orr is arguably, from anyone who saw him play, the best player ever, and that is yeah. – that is so many people talk about that. What was it about Bobby Orr, a that was just so bloody impressive? But two, um, you would have been around when he signs with the Chicago Blackhawks, and I've read the stories on it. But maybe you can impart some wisdom from being around it back then. Well, I know there's young defensemen listening out there, but and I'll, I'll give you just the year he played for me. Uh, he had 46 goals. Now that's hard to believe. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> 46 goals. He had 89 assists, and he was plus 123, <laughs> and he had a, over 100 minutes in penalties. I mean, when you think of that, I mean, that just tells you enough who was the great. And I, and I, he's unbelievable. I mean, uh, he, the big thing about him, he could skate. Him and Coffee, 
Coffee used Coffee was the same type of skater, uh, only he used to go on the outside, and Bobby, unfortunately, used to go to the inside. And when you went to the inside, back in those days, they really hit. And uh, that's why, you know, a lot of people don't realize that he retired at 28 years old. 28 years old. And defensemen, if you look at Coffee and that, they were just coming into their prime yeah. at uh, 28. And a defenseman, as you know, you played. You just started to learn the game. It takes you that long almost. And he retired at the top, at the very top. Let's see, he won the scoring title. He won the scoring title twice as a defenseman. And um, he went to uh, Team Canada. He was picked the MVP, and then he went to Chicago. And nobody ever saw him in Chicago because I, I think he only played about 17 games or something like that. So nobody ever saw him on the way down. That's that's why everybody or, or anybody that saw him play, and uh, nobody ever saw him on his way down because we all go, we all you know get older, but they only saw him at the very top. And imagine that forty six goals. Coffee was I think Coffee was close to that. I forget what, but Coffee was uh, him and Coffee were the best skaters I ever saw. One uh, I read. And maybe even Ron had said this too about your love or fascination with Hollywood, uh, whether it be movies, uh, commercials, etc. I mean, you're iconic for your suits and just the way you presented yourself, which uh, will be forever emblazed on my brain. Um, what was it about Hollywood that that uh, you enjoyed so much, Don? I don't know. I get all the books on them, and um, I, I like Anthony Hopkins and and guys like that, and Errol Flynn, and, and I I just don't know. And I read all the books on the producers. I read that one book. It was by Robert Evans. Uh, the kid stands in the picture, and I don't know. I am. I go from uh, Hollywood to uh, Sir Francis Drake and Lord Nelson, and. Uh, I think if you read the books on uh, Sir Francis Drake or Lord Nelson, you'll see w- w- how my philosophy in life is. And I don't know why it is with Hollywood. I was always reading books, so sometimes <laughs> Ron used to make fun of me. I'd read the books on uh, Joan Crawford or somebody like that, and it, and it was and I would always hide the, uh, the cover eh, because people would make fun of you. <laughs> then, but. Um, he, I, yeah, I did. I, I, I always I read all the stories on, um, uh, 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 you know, I've got, I've got all the books. But, but Sir Francis Drake and Lord Nelson to me, and 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 and, and uh, Shackleton, and guys like that. I used to read about books all the time and everything. I, I don't know why, but I just did. <laughs> and he, he used to make fun of me all the time. <laughs> I watched a documentary here. It was kind of a, a mini series documentary kind of thing, and part of it was uh, behind the scenes of Coach's Corner. And I, I, uh, I understand a bit, but I, I was always very impressed on how much time you guys spent, and specifically you, on what you were going to say on your segments. Uh, I, I don't think the average person realizes how much time uh, Don was spending figuring out what he was going to say and running it by guys and making sure that it was the right thing or maybe the most impactful thing? Well, I tell you the truth. Uh, the, the, I used to have, have, have um, Kathy Broderick. Was, uh, she was there. <laughs> she had red hair, I remember. <laughs> she was just, and she, she, knew, she, she knew, she picked things out and she'd tell me before, you know, we, had, we talked about uh, Saturday morning. <clears throat> but we, I didn't go over with Ron. We used to, at uh, 9.30, he used to get up. But we used to talk. We used to talk over. Uh, and he, 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 well, can you mention this? Can you mention that? <clears throat> I noticed they don't mention the, the Allen Cup and things like that anymore. I, that was a big thing with me because um, amateur, that was an amateur in the Amateur Cup. I don't know why. And, uh. I used to have a lot of fun. Well, I, I just the big thing is that I did what uh, I didn't, and I think that what's got me in trouble is that um, that, that a lot of people uh, didn't like it. But I used to try to do it. I, I if if uh, if the older hockey players would watch it, 
and it seemed to seem to work out pretty good. But I, if the older hockey players would like it, I didn't want them to think I was a phony. I think that's what I think that's the. I, I remember a lot of things we said. Ah, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. But um, it. it uh, I used to talk about the, the older uh, older players a lot. I think a lot of people. I used to I used to get sick of me talking about Bobby Orr. I guess, but I used to have a lot of fun. Uh, I think uh, I think <laughs> you talking about the older players and the stories from the past was what made it so so genuine to me, right? Like you're talking about your experience. You had like you had a career, man. Like all the years in the minors, uh, making the Stanley Cup Finals, Coach of the Year. Uh, I mean, it, just listening about it here this morning is, uh, like I say, it's it. It's something I won't soon forget. Here's one for you that's a blast from the past, Don. I I did not realize this, and I assume people from our area maybe knew at the time, or maybe it's been long forgotten. But I had read a story uh, last night that said when the Saskatoon Blues were going to be a thing, the St. Louis yeah. Blues, for people who recall, were going to move to Saskatoon, become the Saskatoon Blues. Bill Hunter was bringing them here. I think it was 1983. Well, Bill, yeah. Well, Bill, yeah. And you had agreed to be the head coach. Yeah, and, and we were one step away, and uh, and and he brought me to the arena, and showed me the arena. He said we can put another five thousand on each end, and we can get up around sixteen thousand. We were all set to go, and we were all and and somebody stepped in a checker dome down there. I forget them. Forget the guy's name. Anyhow, he bought the club, and they, they did not want to go. They, they said that. <laughs> it really makes me laugh. That was before, um, you know. They said Edmund. They said the people at West. They didn't realize the people at West will drive 200 miles to see a game. Doesn't mean a thing. And um, well, Bill, he had it all set up, boy, and uh, him and Vi and his wife, and they were all set to go. And um, uh, he was, he was, he was. Hey, boy, can he? Boy, would did he ever promote? I'll tell you that he was. It, it would it would have been a success with me. We'd still be we'd still be going, but we we're only we we're only one guy away, and one guy stepped in and bought it. The NHL did uh, hockey at West will never go. <laughs> boy, that boy, are they wrong? They were wrong because uh, as we know in Saskatchewan here, and you've hit the nail on the head, people are willing to drive an awful long ways to see professional Nothing sports. Yet. Just take a look at the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. I tell you what, they, they got the best fans probably across any yeah, sport absolutely. because it's the only professional well now they have the rush but at the time it was the only professional sports Saskatchewan had so I, I I married a girl from Minnesota and I was at a Vikings game and sure enough there's the green Saskatchewan Rough Riders jerseys yeah, walk around yeah. and being a Saskatchewan boy you gotta go talk to them now and and then you sit there and have a beer with them and it's awesome and and that's what Saskatchewan they're proud of they're proud of where they're from and they're proud of their team and if the St. Louis or Saskatoon Blues had ever happened on you probably would have been an absolute legend in Saskatchewan bigger than you are right now and the Blues would probably be one of the one of the strongest teams right now I bet because oh yeah if it ever came to Saskatchewan they never would have let them leave never did they and they had a brand new arena and he and he could put five thousand, and we're all set to go. <clears throat> and I I was all set to go too. I was I was really looking forward to it. And by God, some guy stepped in and and the National League gave it to him. I think he, we were going to pay more money in the whole deal and everything. It didn't make any difference. They did not want a team out west. Boy, can you imagine it? We well, we've been like the we've been like the Rough Riders. We'd we'd we would be packing them in still out there, and. Um, it was terrific. Wild Bill was so disappointed. I remember, uh, I remember phoning me, telling me that uh, somebody had stepped in, but he thought he had it, and that that would have been. But we would have, we would have, we would have been packing them in, still packing them in there. And boy, that boy, what a team that would have been. Well, one other one other team that you coached that is no more was the Colorado Rockies, and I did not realize this until I start until I started doing some research on it, Don. That uh, you know, watching. <laughs> watching you growing up the name hardy astrum just i everybody knew it the swedish sieve right like i just I say, and then i started reading the story on the colorado rockies and i'm like oh my god hardy astrum was the goalie there i'm like 
Well, that makes sense, right? I guess I just, as a kid, I always thought it funny uh, how the stories went. Um, the Colorado he wasn't Rock. A bad guy. No, <laughs> I, I don't. He was a bad guy. His, his only he problem just couldn't was stop talking. a puck. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was with New York, I think, you and uh, we, we ended up with him. And I, I think the, the general manager, Ray Miron, had, had signed him to pretty big money. So he, he let us die with him. And, you know, the a big thing we had, Dougie Favell, who was about not, and he had, a, and I found out later, he had a big argument with uh, Ray Miron. And I couldn't figure out why we didn't have Dougie Favell. And he had, a, he had a big argument with a guy named, he was general manager. And I remember he gave me a book and uh, when I first went there. And all I know about hockey, he opened it up and had blank pages. Little did I know. But I remember Hardy. He wasn't a bad guy. He, just, you know, he he really wasn't a bad guy. He was from, I think he's from Sweden. <clears throat> His only problem was pucks, and and we had a pretty good club. We, I mean, we had uh, Rene Robert, we had Bobby Schmatz, we had uh, Lanny McDonald. Lanny McDonald got uh, uh, twenty five goals in forty five games. We we had we had a real good we had a real good club. You, what, what killed us was our goal. I went from <clears throat> Boston Bruins that had terrific. Two goalies, the Jilly Gilbert and uh, and uh, Jerry Cheevers, to um, Hardy Astrom. <laughs> I paid the price. I paid the price. <laughs> <laughs> so I wonder what Hardy's doing. I think he's coaching now. I hope he's got a good goaltender. Well, he he became he became famous off the con. Well, like I say, Hardy Astrom, the name just sticks with me even to this day because I just remember the sweetest sieve. <laughs> oh, those are great memories. Only, only, I remember. I remember the very first practice we had. Uh, you flip it. It flipped it in. And I flipped it. Flipped the puck to him, and he missed it. I went home and I. I said to Rose, I said, "You better be ready." I said, "I don't think we're going to be here around too long with that goaltender," <laughs> and we weren't. And I and I think he. I think he hard, I think he stayed for the two years after I left too, and um, and then they moved to um, New, New Jersey, Jersey. I think it was. Yeah, New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. yeah New Jersey. I think it it had to be it had to be um they were they were you know they were ready to pack it in I think I, I think I, I nobody could uh, let a team die like that cuz we had a pretty good club. Well, I'll slide it into our final segment here Don. Uh, once again, do really appreciate you coming on. Um the Crude Master Final Five, a shout-out to Heath and Tracy McDonald, the supporters of the podcast since the very beginning. It's just five quick questions for you, Don, and then I'll let you get on with your day. Um, the first one always is, if you could sit down, and I know you've sat down with a lot of people, but if you could have one person to sit down with that you haven't had yet, or maybe you'd like to do again, who would who would you want to sit and have a beverage with just to pick their brain? Well, you live, you mean live, or, or I, in, in the past would be Sir Francis Drake. I would like to talk to him and and learn how he became such a leader. And um, but I think Bobby Orr was, I, and I talked to him quite a bit. And uh, I think Bobby Orr. Okay. And, and you know, and you're dropping a few names there, but uh, him and I talked quite a bit. If you were commissioner of the NHL for a day and could either. Put in a rule or take out a rule. What would you do? Well, first of all, I'd get the icing straightened out. I mean, that is still. Uh, but I, I think the uh, instigator rule is the worst rule ever put into hockey. A guy that starts the fight uh, could get ten, seven, and and you have a guy sticking. You no, know, I instigator rule. That would be the one rule I'd take out. Uh, I, I think it's absolutely ridiculous. But I have to admit that uh, Bettman, Gary Bettman, doing a pretty good job. That. Uh, the salaries have gone from about uh, Zippo to, uh, you know, but I, so I think I, I can't knock Gary Bettman. I, I know I have no affiliation or anything now, but uh, he's done a pretty good job with the money the guys are making. Well, my favorite player to this day growing up, I got a picture of him and Gordy sitting in the studio here with Steve Eisman, as Steve Eisman. Um, I was wondering if you got a Steve Eisman story. Well, you know, you see that picture of him, and they scored on Sportsnet of uh, scoring that goal. It was a great goal. It was the top corner. It was an overtime goal. Yeah. And he let it go. <clears throat> a lot of people don't realize, and he was jumping around. Players jumped on him and um, and, and hurt his knee. He couldn't play. <laughs> he got hurt doing the celebration. 
<laughs> and um, you'll see that goal uh, quite a bit because it's a great goal. He, he shoots it from the right, right-hand side, and he puts it in the top corner, and you see him jumping around. A lot of people don't realize, but um, he was a great little guy. He was protected by um, the Bruce brothers, um, Joey Kosher and Bobby Probert. And um, he always give credit to uh, those two guys, that uh, uh, and Bobby Probert and uh, Joey Kosher. So uh, Iserman, he, he, he's, got, he's got a good job now. I don't know what he's trying to do in Detroit. And uh, he's going to take, did a great job in Tampa, and he lived, I think he wants to stay in Detroit. Well, I hope he hope, – hope, I always cheer for Detroit because of Stevie Eiserman. Yeah, he's uh, always loved how he conducted himself and still conducts himself. And when he yeah, was on one knee in the playoffs, their last run, man, was there anything more, I don't know, endearing? Like, I mean, just like, man, you want to see that guy win. Like, you could just tell yeah, every every yep. shift hurt. He blocked shots, and uh, he had a bad knee. I knew he had a bad knee, and he's still blocking shots. And everybody loved uh, – if you don't love uh, Stevie Eiserman for the way he played, uh, heart and soul, he was the heart and soul of Detroit of all those great clubs. The nickname Grapes. Now, obviously, last name Cherry, to me, it probably makes sense, but was there a guy, or do, or how did the nickname Grapes come up? Well, Jerry Yeeman, uh, he, he he was from out west, and uh, he was a great guy, and he gave me a he, – he was kidding me all the time just to play, play on the name Cherry. And uh, Jerry Eman was the guy that gave me that name, uh, and he played for the Toronto Maple Leafs, and he, I think he got 11 assists one. one uh, uh, he, he really played well, and he played with me in Springfield, and uh, he was great. I always thought he'd be a great coach, and he ended up a scout for uh, the Islanders, I think it was. But uh, it was Jerry Eman that gave me the name, <laughs> and he was, he was a good guy. He'd be, he would have been a great coach. Your final one. I was watching. I was watching some uh, uh, of your earliest interviews that I could find, and one of the questions you used to ask the NHL players that I uh, I really enjoyed was, "Who's helped you on your way? Who helped Grapes on his way?" Well, Bob Clark, I'd have to say, <clears throat> one of the owners for um, uh, that um, he got me to coach the high school team. He says, "You're not doing it. I think you're unemployed." <laughs> I said, "True." And uh, and he was the guy that gave me the call that uh, it, do we want to coach um, the Rochester Americans? Holy night! And I didn't. I was I had no money coming in. And he says, "Don't you even want to know the how much we're paying you?" I said, "No, I just want the chance." So I'd say the Lord first of all, and then Bob Clark was the guy that uh, got me started. And I know nobody's ever heard of Bob Clark, but he. He was from Rochester, New York, and he was the guy that got me started, first of all, with the, uh, the high school and then with the Rochester Americans. One bonus one then for you, uh, Don, is maybe what's one of the best lessons you learned along the way? Huh, I never had, had that one asked me. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> say what you mean and uh, mean what you say. It <laughs> got me fired at the end, but... Uh, <clears throat> I always meant what I said. I never, I, I think the people saw that I wasn't a phony. I never wanted to be a phony. And uh, everything I said on television, I meant every word of it. And unfortunately, it got me fired. But, um, oh, well, it, you, have to, you have to do what you have to do. Appreciate it, uh, you coming on, uh, Don. It's, it's been an absolute treat. And, the longest, uh, this is the longest uh, one I've ever done in my life. And I can see you're a good guy. And that's why I did it. My voice is starting to go. I haven't done it in a long time. <laughs> and uh, God love you, and keep it up. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Don. Hey, folks, thanks again for joining us today. If you just stumble on the show and like what you hear, please click subscribe. Remember, every Monday and Wednesday, a new guest will be sitting down to share their story. The Sean Newman Podcast is available for free on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever else you find your podcast fix. Until next time.